You know, and again, the purpose of this whole thing was, you know, that we could look back at this moment, at these three days that we went through, and say, if I can get through that, I can get through anything. Hello, everyone. It's time for another episode of Martial Arts Radio, the show that brings you amazing stories from the world's best martial artists. Today, we're talking to Wrenchy Craig Sargent, and this is episode 122. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and the founder of the company, Whistlekick. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. If you're new to the show or our great products, please have a look at a brand new item, our Pro Hoodie. It's a lightweight polyester hooded sweatshirt with a bit of color and a lot of comfort. We nearly sold out of them at the very first event we brought them to, but you can find yours at whistlekick.com. All of our sparring gear is at whistlekick.com and also on Amazon. If you want the show notes, including photos and links to everything we talk about today with Renji Sargent, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, please sign up. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of the Whistlekick websites. Over the last year and a half, there have been guests that I've wanted to get to know better. And I've known today's guest for a few years. Despite quite a few conversations, I felt like there was a lot more that I didn't know. It wasn't more than 15 minutes into today's episode before I realized my instincts were correct. Renji Craig Sargent had a lot more to say than I'd heard during our brief chats. Right from the beginning, he opens up and he takes us on a ride like few have with this show. I can say I know Renji Sargent much better now, and I look forward to seeing him at tournaments and other martial arts events. So let's welcome him to the show. Renchi Sargent, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Hey, it's it's great to have you. Um, you know, our our paths have crossed quite a bit over the last couple of years, and I've enjoyed getting to know you. And, you know, I, I'm honestly a little bit embarrassed that it's taken this long because <laughs> I guess part of me had just assumed that we'd already had you on the show, but we haven't. And rectifying that now, and of course, my apologies to you oh, and no, to no. everyone out there. Um, no problem. But, you've, you've had a lot of great, great people on the show, so uh, they definitely deserve to be on the show way more than I do. So, uh, uh, no worries on that. I just I appreciate being being on the show. Well, well, thank you, and I'll agree with everything other than than people deserving to be on the show more okay. than you. Everybody's got their story. Everybody's story is unique. Everybody's story is really worth sharing, and. Um, you know, that's kind of the tough part as the show grows and there's more interest and more people who are willing to come on the show. How many of these can we do in a week? And right now it's just one. And, and the idea of adding two or three or four freaks me out a little bit. But we might get to the point where we have to do that because there's so many great people to talk to. It's one of those good but, problems to have. Yeah, it really is the best kind of a problem for sure. Now, you're a martial artist. I'm a martial artist. But what I don't know about you is really how you got started. So yeah. why don't you go back? Tell us how you got going with the martial arts. All right, so this is this is a good story. <laughs> you know, it's kind of kind of a a long one. Um, so, I have been a boys and girls club kid since I was five years old. So, uh, that, and that's where I kind of started started martial arts was at the boys and girls club in Waterville. So I was you know a club kid since I was five. So I've gone through the program, and you know probably when I hit about ten years old. You know, um, some things kind of changed in my life. My parents got divorced. Uh, my my father um, kind of fell into a deep depression. Um, so the family kind of just fell apart in, in my life, um, unfortunately. So that, you know, kind of led me to kind of go down the wrong path, start hanging out with some of the wrong kids in school, and definitely just a, a, a troubled, troubled youth. Um, and that pretty much lasted until I was about... 12 years old and and then we ended up getting a new director at the boys and girls club from new rochelle new york his name was ken walsh he was a black belt in henson Ru karate and in order for him to even take the job there he said he had to be able to start a martial arts program so he had me take classes with him so yeah so he, he you know he saw the the struggles i was going through and 
uh, was like, you need to try to come into these classes, try to take these classes. And I was like, there's no way I can afford these classes. This, this is not possible. So he ended up pretty much letting me take karate classes for free at the old boys and girls club. So um, I got in it, kind of realized that it was something I really loved doing. I loved being able to to be in the class with, you know, and I actually jumped into the adult program, which was kind of neat, you know, so here I am 12 years old and I'm training in the adult class. And, you know, I had all these great mentors that were right there leading me through the classes, helping me, you know, become a more mature person. And, and it definitely just changed my life. I had a new passion. So all those things that I were was once involved with, I, I didn't want anything to do with them because, I loved karate so much. It was so important to me, um, you know, to the point where even prior to that, when I was in school, I was actually asked to leave school and I had to, to become part of a, an alternative education program because of the problems I was having in school. <clears throat> and martial arts gave me that focus to be able to get myself back into the mainstream school to get, you know, to be able to be accepted back in and, and graduated from mainstream uh, high school which was, you know, great. And it was all because of, of joining the martial arts. Um, so that's kind of where I got my started. Uh, my start was um, through that, that process right there of uh, just meeting Xi'an Ken and him saying, hey, you need to get into these classes. And I was like, all right. So, of course, we hear from you kind of the the alternate reason that a lot of people start martial arts. You know, I, I think, and you're an instructor, you're a school owner, you see how many students come in for self-defense, for hmm. discipline. And, you know, I guess those are kind of two different things, but, you know, yours is a little bit separate. And, and I've seen quite a few, especially younger people over the years that were lost. I mean, I, I don't know if you'd agree with, with that labeling, yep. but that's kind of the impression I got from your story. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely lost. You know, it was uh, definitely you know, searching for something and I didn't even know it at the time. Uh, but, and, and then when I found it, it was just, it clicked. Uh, it was, it was just night and day. It was like, Oh, I love this. I think I loved it at the very first class. The very first class was like, this is what I want to do. This is it. Um, and, and you know, what, I, I, oh, go ahead. what do you think it was? I mean, it, it, to love something the first time you do it, to be that dedicated I mean, that's, that's a, you know, that's a puzzle piece sort of a fit, right? I mean, exactly what you needed is exactly what that was. Right. What do you think that was? You know, there, I think there's a lot of things that it was. I think one, it was, it was that mentorship. It, it was that, you know, having those, you know, older people looking out for me, you know, right from the very beginning was, you know, important to me, especially being in the situation I was, um, you know, I was in with my family life. I, I think having those mentors there was uh, a definitely a big part of it, not the only part. I think too, you know, I was definitely a scrawny kid growing up and wasn't very big um, and, you know, got into a lot of fights and not always, you know, for my benefit. <laughs> and I you know right. karate was, uh, was something that I kind of just was good at. It, I just, you know, I remember one of the first classes he had us doing spin kicks. I mean, here I am a white belt and he's like, hey, let's try some spin kicks. And I actually did it my first try. I'm like, no way. How, you know, I just did something my first try. You know, so I think it was also like realizing that I had potential in something. And I was like, wow, all right, I like this. I can do something. I'm actually, I got potential in something. You know, so I think there was a lot of different aspects uh, in it that, that kind of gave me that focus. Yeah, and I think there was probably a clean slate opportunity there for you, whether you realized it consciously or not. And you know, you, you move through this piece quickly, but your instructor must have had some experience with you if he recognized how important it was for you to come take class that he wasn't going to charge you. Right. Yeah. He, he, um, he had many meetings with uh, the former director and the, uh, the assistant director of, of what I was like. And um, so I think he kind of sought me out and, and when he took over the, uh, the director um, position at the Old Boys and Girls Club. And kind of sought me out, knowing that I was in, in, in definitely a a kid in need for some direction. And you know, I remember one experience being at the old boys and girls club. I got so mad that uh, because they kicked me out because I wasn't listening to the rules, that I actually shattered one of the windows. You know, I kicked the window and shattered it. And um, and instead of you know charging me for it, which they should have, instead here they are <laughs> inviting me to classes to to you know try to turn my life around. 
Um, so yeah, he, he definitely saw that in me and, and like I said, came toward, you know, came to me and was like, you need to, to come into these classes. And, and there's a lot of compassion there. I mean, not just individually, but organizationally. Right. And I think that that's fantastic. And I, I've got a feeling as we, we continue on through these questions, as we learn more about you, that that's going to become a theme because, you know, right. from what I know of you, there's a lot of compassion in the way that you've chosen to live your life. Right. And I think that's, that's fantastic. And it's something that I think most martial arts instructors end up with. Mm. You know, most martial arts instructors certainly aren't teaching for money. Right. <laughs> right. Definitely. So there's something else. There's that recognition that that I don't want to say more so than other places, but it's an opportunity to change lives right. through the martial arts with that compassion. So that's a pretty good story. It's a great way to get started. It gives us an idea of, of the transition that you've made. And as we go, we're going to get to understand more of what that transition really is. I mean, that complete 180. Mm. But I know there's a lot of other stories going on oh, yeah. <laughs> with you and through your life. So if I was to pin you down for your best one, what would it be? All right. So yeah, um, I would say the best story, especially, especially the best martial arts story, um, besides my, my beginning of how I got involved with the, with the martial arts was my black belt test. So Xi'an Ken has a very unique black belt test where instead of being like a one day test, uh, he has a three day black belt test. It starts on Friday at about five o'clock in the morning and we're not ending until Sunday, you know, usually about five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and the whole purpose of this black belt test is he already knew that, you know, that we have, you know, the black belts have the technique to be black belts, but to him, it's more than just having skills. It's about having heart. It's about having the ability to persevere through challenges. So my, my first day of my black belt test actually was, uh, I remember meeting him at his house, you know, right around five o'clock, you know, and this is in the middle of December, 1995. We were like having a kind of a snowstorm on our way coming up, you know, up the coast and, or actually coming down from Canada, I should say. Um, and, and so it was going to be a challenging weekend. And here he is, he has us start off five o'clock in the morning with a canoe around snow pond. And that was horrible because one, I hate winter and two, I'm not a big fan of the, you know, anything in lakes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I had to jump in a canoe, um, with another gentleman, his name was Dave Penarelli, who was going for his black belt test as well. And, and we had the canoe around thinking, you know, when we come back to shore and we are thinking we're done and he, Sean Ken's waiting for us and he's like, no, oh, no, no, you're not done. See that Island. You have to go around that Island and come back and you only have 20 minutes to do so. Now, this was a cold winter, and there was already ice around the lake, so we weren't even paddling. We were actually using that little part at the end, and we were having to hook into the ice and drag the canoe through the ice. I don't know how we made it in 20 minutes, but somehow we did. <laughs> um, so here we are. We're, we're coming back again, and we're like, okay, this canoeing thing or this water thing's got to be done. And so we, we get into his house, and there's Sheehan Ken hanging out in his hot tub and we're like woo all right hot tub time get a little bit of some relaxation so we're he's like go get in your bathing suits and so we're all excited getting our bathing suits we're getting ready to go into the hot tub he's like no no no, no i don't think so he's like you got to dive into the lake we're like what so we had to do this you know polar bear dip we had to run in jump in that might have been the fastest i've ever run in my life i think i jumped in and i don't even remember touching the water i think i was already out <laughs> Um, but, so we had to dive in, come out, and then finally he was nice and let us into the hot tub for a little while. Um, not for too long, though. Um, he, he wasn't that nice. <laughs> so then from there, we uh, we went to this little mountain called uh, French Mountain, and we had to run up it. And then it, when we got up, then we did all of our, our martial arts skills on top of the mountain, uh, which was beautiful, definitely beautiful. Um, you know, because it was so beautiful, I think I actually was okay with the winter at that moment. Um but, uh, you know, so we had to do all our, our kata, our basic blocks, punches, and kicks, our one-step self-defense. Um, so we did all that on top of the mountain. And during this whole time, we're also in, uh, responsible to complete 3,000 push-ups and sit-ups by the end of the weekend. And there is no designated time for this. We have to make our own time to 
to be trying to fit in these, uh, these push-ups and sit-ups during the weekend. So anytime we were kind of resting, we really weren't resting. We were trying to finish up those, those push-ups and sit-ups. Um, so that was pretty much day one of my black belt test. And then day two, we traveled to uh, a mountain called Tumble Down Mountain. I don't know if you've ever been there. It is no. beautiful. Um, when you get on top, there's a, a lake on top of the mountain. Um, it is just, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous mountain. Um, but not probably in December when we actually, that was when the snowstorm officially hit. We were in the middle of the snowstorm. Um, I, I sometimes think that Xi'an Ken might have been a little crazy. Um, <laughs> and maybe that's where I get it from sometimes. Uh, because it was, snow was, a you know, average was knee to waist deep. You know, anywhere in between there was where the snow was going up this mountain. Uh, it was below zero temperatures and I think at one time we, we figured out that the winds must have been right around 40 mile per hour winds at their strongest. And so it was definitely quite the hike up this mountain. Um, you know, and, and I didn't have the best gear for this. I, I don't even remember if I had proper hiking boots. I think I just had a standard thing of regular old hiking boots that you'd wear in the spring or, or summertime. I don't even think I had good winter ones, if I remember correctly. But it was that was a that was a horrible like that that was a challenging day. But I remember during my classes, Xian Ken used to always have this little term that he would he would say to us, it was Hang Sang Sim. And it meant calm, cool mind. So anytime I felt like giving up, every time anytime I was just like, what the heck does this have to do with karate? What is this all about? I would just go back to that and I would say, Hang Sang Sim, calm, cool mind. And I would try to calm down, cool off, and I would just collect myself and and just keep going. I would just keep pressing on. So I remember finally we got to this one point and Xion Ken had us huddling behind a rock, you know, one of those big giant stones and he pulled out an apple and I'll tell you, that was the best tasting apple I've ever had. It was just a standard <laughs> Macintosh, but it, it taught us that sometimes we take things for granted. You know, just a simple apple was just great because we were so tired and exhausted and, it, you know, it just really made us go, wow, you know, we need the, the not take things for granted so much. Uh, you know, so that was more or less day two of our black belt test. I mean, you know, we came back, I think there was a little more canoeing actually involved when we got back, um, unfortunately. And then, you know, finishing up our push ups and sit ups. <clears throat> and uh, also we had a 20 page written exam that we had to, to accomplish, which had to do with, you know, karate background. Uh, also, you know, some different uh, philosophical like questions, like how would you, you know, find your inner self? Um, how would you, you know, inspire other people? You know, and then more, you know, organizational type questions. How would you teach your first karate class? How would you run a tournament? You know, so it was a really well-rounded uh, test that we had to accomplish. And then our last day was more of the standard, what you'd see for a black belt testing. You know, we'd get up early, get there, work out, uh, do our stretching, go through every technique that we've ever possibly learned. And we also had to do you know, different self-defense techniques. We, we have this thing called the circle of doom where we have all these different, you know, uh, students and black belts that come in, they charge in, they attack us and we have to be able to respond right on the spot. We were not actually allowed to use the things that we've learned. We had to come up with our own at times. It was like, you're not allowed to use that one step. You have to do something else. So we had really had to work on our reaction and our instinct and, and having the, the martial arts just kind of come out, you know, in those moments. Um, that was one of my favorite parts actually of the black belt test. Uh, and then we finish off with 21 rounds of fighting. Uh, so just nonstop, you know, one person coming in after and boom, boom, just 21 rounds, you know, and again, the purpose of this whole thing was, you know, that we could look back at this moment at these three days that we went through and say, if I can get through that, I can get through anything. Um, and, you know, so that's kind of the purpose behind our three-day black belt test is to, to give the, the, the students more than just a belt around their waist, but to give them something that they can use as a tool through any struggles that they have in their life. So they will be able to look back at those three days and say, I made it through that. I can make it through this. So I would say that's my best martial arts story is my black belt test because that wouldn't really help me out in, in life. Wow. And my black belt test was not, not, none of my black belt tests have been anywhere close to as intense or as, I should say, as long as what you experienced there. And, and you know, here I am, I'm, I'm trying to imagine 
canoeing through ice, you know, being an icebreaker in a, in a canoe and jumping in that water and the experience of that apple. I mean, some really intense stuff. And, um, I'm conflicted whether or not I'm jealous for that <laughs> level of experience because I, I look back on my original black belt test with the same attitude. If I can make it through that, I can make it through anything. Right. But mine was not nearly as lengthy as yours. So, um, how do you run tests at your school now? Uh, the same are they, way. are they as intense? Yeah, they are. They are. Um, in some ways I, I stuck, stuck with, uh, Xian Ken's traditions, and then I, you know, developed my own. Um, you know, he's not my only instructor. I also have another instructor named uh, Xian Javier Diaz. Uh, he's a seven degree black belt in Shudokan Karate, who is another major influence in my life, especially in my martial arts life. So I've also adapted a lot of the things I've learned from him into what I've what I do now. Um, <clears throat> so I actually started started studying with uh, Xian Javier. This is actually kind of a, a unique story. <clears throat> Excuse me. Xian Javier is my my first instructor, Xian Ken's original instructor. So it's, there's this kind of cool uh, dynamic that, that takes place here. Um, and if you don't mind, I, I'll give you the backstory. Please, that, please right. do. Absolutely. So my instructor started karate in, I believe it was like 1982. And he actually started studying under Xian Javier Diaz, uh, who was here for about six months from Mexico. And they, so they started training in the new Rochelle, New York area every day, three hours a day, you know, all the way up until Xian Javier had to leave back to Mexico. So during this time, Xian Ken was looking for, you know, another martial arts instructor. And, and so he got uh, hooked up with the head instructor of a style called Wan Do, which was primarily judo and uh, taekwondo based. And so he started studying heavily into that, got his black belt in that but still had his roots in the Shudokan karate that he added that in to what he, uh, to the Wanwa Do system and then developed, you know, Henson Ru with some help from a, another good friend of his named Xian Tommy May, who was a eighth degree black belt in Ishinru karate. And they used to get together and train. That was one of the cool things about my instructors. He used to get together with a lot of the different instructors in the New Rochelle, New York area and regularly they would practice and share knowledge. And so, you know, Henson Ru was kind of based on that. It was based on sharing knowledge. It was based on growth. It was based on not being limited to what we do. This is what we do, then nothing else. You know, it's always been mm -hmm. encouraging of, hey, you got another idea of how to do this? I want to learn it. Hey, I have an idea. Let me share it with you. Um, you know, so that was his philosophy with, with Henson Ru. Well, they ended up... Uh, reconnecting in the early 2000s, uh, him and uh, Xian Javier, Xian Ken and Xian Javier reconnected in, in the early 2000s. And he invited Xian Javier to come to Maine for several years. So during that time, I ended up getting you know introduced to Xian Javier Diaz and started training in Shudokan with him. And so he was there for several years, ended up having to go back to Mexico and then we ended up reconnecting again in about 2010, and I started training with him. And, and the great thing is technology was so much better. So we actually used to be able to train through Skype. I would actually project him onto a screen, and we would be able to mm. do that when we had the when we had that ability here. And so I trained with him for 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 a while, uh, doing Shudokan karate and, and learning the more traditional like Japanese based you know karate. And then that's where I kind of come in with, with developing, you know, the, what I learned with Henson Ru and what I learned with Shudokan and uh, coming up with what we now call uh, Club Naha Karate Do. And, you know, the reason we, we named it Club Naha Karate Do was to kind of stay in lines with some of the great masters of like Gichin Funakoshi, Tiyoma Kan Ken, whose style is actually named after their dojo. You know, Shotokan was their dojo. Shudokan was the dojo. So we decided to name our style after our dojo, which was Club Naha. So it's Club Naha Karate Do is what we currently teach here. And so learning from both of those who are, you know, Xian Ken and Xian Javier, and they're definitely different, different people when it comes to martial arts. One is very much, you know, about the, you know, the philosophical end and how it's, you know, character building and Xian Javier being more of the technician and, you know, um, the traditional end of the hardcore martial arts. Uh, it was definitely really a, a 
big influence on how I now teach because I've got both kind of pieces of the pie, if you know what I mean. And, and I kind mm, of teach from, yeah. from both perspectives. And I also run my black belt test. So going back to the black belt test, I run my black belt test the same way. I run it through that character building, you know, giving them that, that thing to look forward to in the future of being able to look back at the test. And, but also really every day is traditional martial arts being included. You know, so they might do some of those, you know, hardcore exercises and then a karate class. And then, you know, I, I do everything, you know, in their gi. All right, you're going to be doing this whole thing in your gi. When I did my black belt test, it wasn't in our gi until the very last day. But hiking up a mountain, you're in your gi. You're doing, mm. you know, going for a run, you're in your gi. You know, just trying to keep that traditional martial arts part of it, you know, embedded into the, into the black belt test, you know. Sure. Wow. And, you know, certainly a lot of people, a lot of schools these days are based on the influences of multiple styles. I mean, I, I my original school back in the 80s was was founded on that. I had two instructors who got married and, and even one of them had multiple instructors. So, you know, we see these these influences coming right. from so many different directions. And I really think that's great because it gives people the opportunity to cultivate what resonates for them right. and allows instructors to really build the school and thus the students that they want to have. So it's clear that martial arts is is probably the the biggest single piece in your life, maybe outside of your family. I don't certainly don't want you to have to say that <laughs> martial arts is more important than your family, even if it is. But when you're not training, when you're not teaching, do you have any other hobbies, anything else that, that really speaks to you outside of martial arts? Uh, you know, outside of martial arts, you know, I... I <laughs> Kind of, you know, one thing I, I am, okay. I, I am big into is I love anything related to graphic design. You know, I, I love doing flyers. I love doing t-shirts. Um, but now it's still kind of connected with the martial arts because a lot of the things I do revolve around martial arts. I love doing, you know, right. t-shirts for martial arts. I love doing, you know, the, you've probably seen some of my things that I do on Facebook, you know, when I'm advertising for different. Terms. Really? No, not, not, not at all. <laughs> You know, so for, I just, for anyone that that is not part of the the New England and specifically the main martial arts uh, groups, uh, what I'm laughing at is that Wrenchy Sargent will turn out a meme photo or some other graphic, uh, seemingly in seconds at the drop of a hat. There was there was one time I think it was something that Whistlekick was coming to uh, one of your tournaments, mm. and and we hung up the phone and I I want to say it was like two minutes later. There was something posted on the line, and it, it it looked elaborate. It looked it was something that looked like it took some time. So, uh, I'm getting a chuckle out of that. Yeah, so I love that stuff. You know, and, and it's gotten to a point where, um, you know, here at the Alphon Youth Center, uh, different uh, departments, you know, like athletics department, will will come to me and say, "Hey, I'm got a dodgeball tournament coming up. Can you help me with the poster?" And I'm like, "Sure, no problem." You know, and I'll I'll develop the poster for for that dodgeball tournament. You know, so I do a lot of things like that too. Um, you know, here at my job. And uh, I just, I love that stuff. I, I love anything, you know, creative that, you know, is graphic design related. Well, now you mentioned, I mean, you've brought it up, so now I'm going to poke at it a little bit. So you work at a youth center. I do. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, there, I, I mean, there's, there's a pretty I've, I've got, I've got a guess. There's a tie there. I mean, a youth center, you, you said early on, and and the martial arts program there really changed. Maybe I could even say saved in a sense your life, and now you're employed there or right. at a different. One. This is actually the same the same one. So uh, in ni- the late '90s, the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA here in in the Waterville area merged, and we are the only merged YMCA and Boys and Girls Club in the country. Uh, so they merged together under one roof. And started raising money and got funded to build a new building, which is now called the Elfon Youth Center. You know, so the Elfon Youth Center is the home of the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club in the Waterville area. And uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I was actually a club kid since I was five. And I am still here today, um, you know, now teaching the, the karate program here, you know, being the head karate instructor and martial arts coordinator here at the, uh, the Elfon Youth Center. So why? I, I won't even ask the question more specifically than that. 
because I know what it did for me, and I want to give that same ba- thing back to other children. One of the things I love about working here is we are a nonprofit organization. Um, so it's, I'm not, I don't have the same concerns that some commercial dojos might have, um, which allows me to, I think, reach out to kids that might not have the potential to do, you know, the possibility of doing karate because of financial reason, reasons. You know, we're not restricted to that. We, we have the opportunity to give these kids um, access to our program. You know, so we, we get kids from, you know, all different, you know, places in their life, you know, in their social lives and their economic lives, you know, in this dojo. And it's great. And, you know, so I, I have this passion to just give these kids the same opportunity I had. And to be able to see what it did for me and to be able to see that same thing happening in these other kids' lives. Maybe not exactly the same way it you know, happened for me, but I'm seeing it happen no matter who's coming in through this dojo. They're getting something beneficial from learning martial arts. You know, you know, it could be that child who was struggling with behavior issues and now they've got their passion. Or maybe it's someone who just was shy and now the karate is taught them how to open up and talk to other people. Or maybe it's someone that didn't realize they had athletic ability and now they realize it through martial arts and have moved on to doing other athletic sport, you know, athletics because of, wow, they found out that through karate, they had that ability. So I just love seeing, you know, not just children, but, you know, anyone that comes through the dojo doors, finding that they have something that they can accomplish. Wow. That's pretty powerful. And I I think it speaks very well to the spirit of teaching the martial arts. And I'm going to guess that there are some people out there listening, some instructors thinking, oh, man, the idea of being able to teach and not having to worry about money. (laughs) That's that's pretty awesome. I mean, you've managed to, to carve out a fantastic niche. And, you know, certainly I've had experiences with a number of your students through the tournaments that Whistle Kick attends and, and all wonderful people. So certainly the program is working. You're, you're doing a great job. So please keep Thank it up. You. I appreciate that. Now, maybe you already hinted at it, or maybe you're going to tell us about something else, but everyone goes through struggles, challenges, and our martial arts experiences often help us overcome those. You know, whether we're referring back to what our black belt test was like and knowing we can overcome anything or, or whatever it might be. Tell us about a low point in your life and sure. how your martial arts training helped you get past it. Uh, so, yeah, um, 2008, uh, I was in, in <clears throat> I had a tragic house fire that, that took place. Um, so at the time I was uh, engaged and unfortunately uh, my fiance was a smoker, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of that, but you know, she was a smoker. Um, and you know, so one night, you know, I went to bed already. My son who was two years old at the time, you know, was sleeping and, and she was, you know, hanging out in the living room with a friend and, and, uh, ended up, you know, not disposing of, of her cigarette properly. Um, and it caught the, the couch on fire and, you know, then it quickly spread. And, and so the whole house pretty much caught on fire and, uh, you know, it was full of smoke. We actually, you know, it, it got so hot in the living room that somehow it, something exploded in there. And I remember, you know, jumping out of bed, grabbing my son, doing the, the little bear type crawl with him under me. And, uh, and next thing I know, I, I collapsed, I guess, and I'm being hauled out by the, uh, by the paramedics and, um, uh, you know, I guess they, they were really surprised that they were, they were even able to find me. And, and they said uh, that they were really surprised that I was even, you know, alive at the time that they found me. Uh, so I remember, you know, being um, in the param- you know, in the, in the ambulance heading to the hospital. And I remember reflecting back to my black belt test. I remember going back to my black belt test saying, okay, if I got through that, I can get through this. I get through this. I can get through this. I can get through this. And I remember, you know, in martial arts, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on breathing. Just breathe, you know, breathe, make sure you breathe, you know, a lot of emphasis on breathing. So I remember going back to that going, okay, 
If I'm breathing, I'm doing good. So just breathe, just breathe, just breathe. You know, and then Hang Sang Sim, that came back to me. You know, keep calm, you know, cool off, just keep breathing. You know, so it was a lot of that, that stuff that I learned through the martial arts that got me through this. You know, I remember being on the table, or not table, on the bed, you know, um, in the emergency room, looking up and, well, kind of looking up. I was actually a little blind. I was, I was struggling really bad because I had so much stuff in my eyes that I was, you know, blind. And I remember just, just keep breathing, Craig. Just keep breathing. Just, just keep breathing. Um, you know, and just again, constantly reflecting back to my black belt test. You know, just I got through that. I can get through this. Um, so that that was what got me through that that fire. Um, you know, in that experience, I remember having to be in a some sort of I can't remember the name of it now. It's a chamber that they pump in pure oxygen into your into your system. I had to go through that. Uh, you know, like I said, I was blind for several, several weeks. I really couldn't see that well. Um, you know, I had to keep putting stuff in my mouth to kind of wash out what was there. Um, my lungs were just had so much stuff in them that they hurt. Um, luckily my son, um, pretty much came, got out of there unscathed because of the way he fell underneath me. I blocked most of the smoke. So he was actually fine. He like the next day he was all running around and being, you know, two year old. So that was a blessing that, that definitely too, I think helped me, you know, get through this. Unfortunately, my fiance at the time did not make it through the fire and, and passed away. Mm. Um, you know, so that, that was definitely, you know, when I, when I found that out, that was, uh, that was kind of a hard hit to, to hear, but I knew, you know, I could do it. I knew I could get through it. I knew through my, my training, through, you know, all the things I've learned, you know, and through being a dad, you know, I, I could make it through that. And that's what got me through. Wow. That, uh, that's a powerful story. And certainly, you know, we've got kind of two sides of the emotional spectrum there, but I mean, I th- you've probably told this story a number of times. But what's striking for me hearing it for the first time is you're focused so much on the positive there. Right. And I'm, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that, that, you know, there isn't still a little bit of pain, at least from the loss of, of your fiance. And if I remember correctly, you are, you, you found someone else, correct? You're, you're married yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. I married so, now, yeah. I mean, you've, you've moved on. Right. Um, but I think a lot of people would focus in on that, on the, on the loss piece, the, the loss of a person, the loss of a home, of belongings. Um, and there's an element in there where you could even blame. I mean, you presented it pretty matter of factly, but, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there that would look and say, well, you know, this is what happened. This is the negative in my life. And it, it wasn't my fault and, and it wasn't your fault, right. but none of that was part of your story there. No. no. And I think that that is far more telling than the actual facts of the story. So what would you chalk that attitude up to? Uh, you know, again, I think it's just that it comes back to my martial arts training, you know, one of, you know, back to Xi'an Ken's uh, philosophies and, and and things that he taught, you know, he, he was one big, big time, you know, just into positive thinking. And I remember we have, you know, we have these different creeds that we had to, to learn. One was called the Tenets of Wama Do, um, which were these seven different kind of guidelines of how to live our lives. But there's, there was another one that he used to do. Uh, it was called the Optimist Creed. And I remember the, the very first line of that was to look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true. So I, I think, you know, I just, I might not even realize that at the time, but I think that was part of that influence was, all right, you know, look at the sunny side. I'm still here. I'm still breathing. I still have my son. I still have my family. I still have all these people that are supporting me, you know, um, you know, and I think that's a big part of it that I didn't mention in there is I had just this tremendous support system behind me. I remember the smart members and, you know, at the time I was just a, a, um, I wasn't the director of SMART. I was just running a, you know, a tournament through the SMART program. I was also you know, a, a member of the IPON circuit. And I remember them getting together and just being behind me, supporting me through this time. You know, so they were a tremendous you know, impact there. Uh, same with my, my karate family, my, my direct family. All of these people were just right there behind me, supporting me through this whole thing. Um, and I think that also just encouraged me. 
you know, and also knowing that the, the impact that I have on, you know, the youth here at the Elfine Center was a good motivator too. It was like, I, I didn't want to let anybody down. I was like, no, I got to, I got to get through this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to get back to class. I'm going to go back to teaching. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, another part that really kept me positive through it. You know, don't get me wrong. I had my meltdowns. I've had my, I had my, my times of, of depression and, and things during this. Um, but because of that support system, those things were very, very minimal, thankfully. <laughs> mm. Wow. Absolutely powerful stuff. And and I'll admit, I got a little bit choked up listening to you there and not, not for the negative side of it, but for your ability to persevere and, and to focus on the good. And I just, I think that that's so powerful. So I, I thank you for bringing that attitude to the martial arts. Now you've talked about a couple of pretty important instructors in your life. Mm. Uh, if we were to take them off of the table, right. who has been the most influential person in your martial arts career? Yeah, so I, I can't really just say one person, I, you know, because there's different stages in my my martial arts career um, that I'd have to say I had multiple people at different stages that influenced different parts. Um, so I don't think I can just give it to one person. I don't think that'd be fair. <laughs> Um, so I, I know early on when I was first, you know, a, a color belt student going for my black belt test, there's this, uh, we had this neighbor and he was, you know, he was, uh, I think about 10, 15 years older than I was. Uh, so he was an adult, he had, you know, and he, he loved martial arts when he was a kid, but never had the opportunity to ever study formally. Uh, he loved it and he knew I was taking it and his son was involved with, uh, with the Elf on you, uh, well, it was the Boys and Girls Club at the time, you know, so somehow him and I got connected, and we would just talk for, like, hours about martial arts, and about, you know, he was a Bruce Lee fan, I was a huge Bruce Lee fan, I was probably obsessed a little bit, um, and we would talk about Bruce Lee, we'd talk about his fighting style, I mean, we just, you know, all those conversations, I think, really helped keep me inspired, you know, I'd have my little low points, like any student does going through martial arts, but it was those discussions that him and I would have that would, that would keep that spark going. They're like, all right, yeah, you know, I want to strive to, to be the next Bruce Lee. I remember wanting to be the next Bruce Lee, you know. Um, I think a lot of people did, you know, in those, you know, like around the 90s or so, you know. Sure. Bruce Lee was still kind of a big, big deal. So, uh, you know, was, you know so I, I really thank him for that early on influence. You know, and then from, you know, there... I would say my next influence was uh, Renji Javier Diaz's son, uh, Sensei Javier Diaz Jr. Uh, he was, you know, younger than I was, uh, but I would see the way he practiced for his father, and the, just the way that he would get in there and dedicate himself to the martial arts was, was inspiring. And when his dad went back to Mexico, he stayed here in Maine. And I remember I was able to go to him and ask him any questions that I might have for, you know, about Shudokan or how do I do this technique or, you know, different things like that. And, and he was always willing to, to help me out. Or if I had questions on, like, the history of, of where, you know, their karate came from, he was always there to, like, give me the answers and, and just talk to me. And, and so he was definitely a big influence when it came to my development in Shudokan karate and learning more about that system. And then finally, I would have to say, you know, and currently, my biggest influences are all the different smart and iPod promoters that are out there. These guys have been doing this stuff for so long, and they're just so knowledgeable, and yet so willing to share that knowledge that they have um, with others. I remember, you know, I, I had that, that sport karate camp, you know, in August, and I remember being able to sit down with Kiyoshi Brent Krishi, and, you know, for just, it seemed like, you know, just hours of him and I talking about different things and he was encouraging me and, and telling me of different ways that he does things and, and let, you know, and it was kind of like you just being willing to share that. So some people are very much like, this is how I do things. I'm going to keep it to myself because I don't want to, you know, share my knowledge of how to run a dojo, you know, but not so with, with these, you know, many promoters, they're willing to give helpful hints and Hey, this is how I've run a tournament or this is how I've done my karate classes. You know, and so I, I learn a lot about teaching. I learn a lot about how to run a tournament, you know, from them. Now, they're definitely just a great group of people 
you know, and a great support system. And uh, so they're right now probably my, my biggest, you know, influence in, in the martial arts. Mm-hmm. And, and a wonderful group of people, absolutely. And I've been fortunate enough to get to know most of them and, and some of them quite well. For those of you that might be outside the New England area, the, the SMART organization is a main tournament circuit and the EPON is a New England tournament circuit. So, uh, and it's through, if you haven't gathered, it's through these events that I got to meet Renchi Sargent originally. One of the things I just want to comment on, I based on this show, right? Because I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to dozens of fantastic martial artists. The best ones are open. They are willing to share. They want their knowledge to pass on. You know, I, I think so the martial arts continues to move forward. So we're not making the same mistakes. Right. So we become better martial artists, martial arts instructors. So the martial arts as a realm, because I haven't come up with a better word. I don't like the word industry when we talk about martial arts. Right. Yeah. That the entire realm moves forward, that we advance, that our martial arts overall is better in 20 years than it is today. So I, I, I think it's great. And I think that most of the people out there are pretty open. Right. And for anyone listening that might feel a re- little resistant to sharing that knowledge, um, take a look at where every Burger King is built. It's right near McDonald's. Right. There's a reason for that. So it's a, it's a consciousness thing. So just because you have someone else in your town, in your area that's teaching martial arts, you're probably doing it a little bit differently. You're probably teaching different arts and you're both probably advertising, you're promoting, and the two of you together, you're going to have more people for each of you than you would if you were the only one, at least long term. So let's talk about competition. I just said it was through competitions that we originally met, but I know you've had some time in the ring. Right. So why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I started competing when I was probably, I have to guess, I, I think I was about 13, 14 when I started to compete. And my very first tournament that I ever participated in was actually in New, New Rochelle, New York. Sean uh, Ken took a group of us down to his old, you know, the old Boys and Girls Club that he was originally the, the assistant director at and that he taught a martial arts program at. And so we went there, we stayed the night. And the next morning, we, we ended up going to this tournament called the Battle of, uh, I always mess this up, I think it's called the Battle of Worcester. <laughs> it, it looks like Worcester, but it's actually spelled slightly different. It was like, I think it was like Worcester. Um, so we, we went there and uh, competed at that tournament. And I believe I placed uh, first in kata and second at fighting at, at that tournament, which was, you know, again, coming from my background, of who I was. And, and I was like, what, you know, it was a big deal to me. I was like, wow, no way. I just like played yeah. in the tournament, you know, and, and I would have been happy with just getting, you know, a medal or anything, you know, about to place first and, you know, in second, I was like, you know, that, that definitely was a, a huge highlight right there. I and mean, that was awesome. Um, so then, you know, I would do tournaments here and there. Shion Ken was never a huge tournament person. You know, that was not really always his major thing was, was doing tournaments. So we would do a couple, you know, Battle of Maine because it's, you know, right across the the river to us, you know, in, in Winslow. So we would do the Battle of Maine. We'd, we'd go to New, to New York once a year and do that. Uh, but I wouldn't say I really was big into it. Yeah, you know, I, I would do it. Um, I remember in 97 or 98, uh, I competed at the Battle of Maine with a good friend of mine. His name is Rob Cloutier. And they had a an event called self-defense and being a huge Bruce Lee fan and loving the fight scenes. My friend Robbie and I kind of came up with, you know, a a little mini fight scene that um, corresponded with the rules of the, of the division and ended up taking first in that, which then brought us to being able to compete with that in, you know, the grand championship division. And uh, we ended up taking the grands in, in self-defense. So that, that was really cool. And uh, also that same tournament ended up taking the grand championship in Kata. Uh, so I think it was really from then that I was like, oh, man, I really like competing. This is fun. Uh, so I started mm. to get a little more serious. And um, and then, like I said, in the early 2000s, Xion Javier came to Maine, and he's big into tournaments. Uh, you know, down in the Mexico uh, area, tournaments are huge. Uh, it's 
just they, they, it seems like there's a tournament every weekend down there. And so he was really big into getting us ready for tournaments. Um, you know, even if we were never going to compete, we should always have the ability to compete, you know, if we ever decided to, you know, that was kind of his thing. So we would, uh, train really hard for competitions. And so during those years, I remember, you know, placing, you know, fairly well, uh, and I'm taking the, the state championship, uh, twice while, while he was here, uh, for both kata and weapons divisions. Uh, then I kind of, you know, he, he left, went back to Mexico and I kind of, uh, you know, got away from being a, a competitor for for quite some time, and in 2010, you know, kind of got that spark again. I was like, hmm, I kind of want to do this again. You know, my students were doing. I was like, I, I probably should lead by example. And I remember I really wanted to get some of my adult students to to start competing. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to lead by example. I'm going to start competing. Uh, so I started getting back in the ring, uh, but I decided my my thing is kata. I wanted to do kata. I love kata, which is really funny. Back in my earlier days, I hated kata. I was a fighter and wanted to fight, 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 fight. That's all I ever wanted to do. Something changed. I ended up loving kata. So I uh, uh, decided to start competing in kata again. And I think from 2010 to about 2012, uh, every main tournament, uh, I ended up placing, you know, first place in kata at all the different, you know, main tournaments uh, through that period of time. And, uh, took home six grand championship titles uh, during that time span. Uh, you know, so I, I definitely just I love kata. It's one of my favorite things, love kata. Um, tried a couple of tournaments out of state. You know, I tried the, um, I think it's called the Central, what is it, uh, the Massachusetts Open Karate Championship, which is a Korean rated tournament. Tried yep. that one out. Uh, got second place. I was happy. I was like, you know, it was a different, different group of people, different, uh, mm-hmm. you know, different experience level um, in, in some regards. And I was like, you know, so second place, I, I, was, I was pretty happy with that. And uh, so from there, I was like, you know, I'm going to try one more, you know, rating system. So I tried uh, the New England Open, uh, you know, which is a NASCA rated tournament. So tried that one out, uh, you know, for traditional kata and ended up taking the third place uh, for that. So um, I was pretty happy. Um, shortly after that, I ended up getting married, um, having another child. So tournaments again kind of took a back burner and you know then just a little while ago taking over the smart circuit become the director of that uh being really more involved with now promoting tournaments uh kind of taken a little bit of a hiatus on on competing even though i, I have to admit i sometimes still have the little itch of like oh man i want to want to get back in the ring <laughs> it's it's hard not to have that itch you know especially when when you've done it when you've done it so much when you've seen value in it when you've seen some success with it. Um, I get that itch once in a while. That's why I I did a couple this year. It had been, it had been 10 years. I figured it was time. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the transition from preferring sparring to forms. And I think the attitude that goes along with that probably parallels your transition as a person Yeah, I think and, and your attitude. I mean, is that, is that fair to say? I definitely think it is. I, I definitely think, you know, when I was younger, um, like I, I talked about earlier, I was a scrawny kid. So I think learning to fight for me was part of that. I, I'm small. I had a little man syndrome, I think. <laughs> you know, I was little. And <laughs> so if I figured if I could learn how to fight, no one's going to mess with me, you know, and I just wanted to be the best fighter. I was like, I don't want to be picked on. I'm going to be the best fighter I can be. Well, I think through just maturing as a martial artist and as a person, you know, and especially where we all know the cliche of, you know, karate is not about fighting. You know, when you learn karate, you learn how not to fight, you know, but those things, even though they're cliche, they're so true, you know, learning my martial arts, I realized I don't need to fight. I don't need to do this because I am learning much more as a person and how to carry myself that I don't need to be the best fighter in the world. You know, I, I can just need to worry about trying to be the best person I can be. And that's going to help me a lot more than trying to be the best fighter in the world. You know, and, and so I think I started getting more into kata, too, because kata is very personal. And it's very, it's you, you know, going against yourself. You know, the only person really holding you back in kata is is you. You know, if if I don't give my best, you know, performance in kata, I can't blame it on anybody else. I can only blame it on me because I held myself back. You know, so it's very much, you know, a personal thing, uh, you know, kata. You know, and I also just love 
the you know the the hidden stuff in kata you know uh, you know that was one of the things i used to just look at as a dance routine using martial art movements you know that's one of those you know people will explain kata to people oh it's like a dance routine you know using karate movements and then when it dawned on me like no it's not there's so much more to kata than just you know do a punch do a block that i was like oh man i love this stuff i love kata you know i don't know if you've ever seen the movie shrek you know when yeah, shrek of course shrek says you know ogres are like onions there's different layers you know, it's yeah. like, wow, that is kata. Kata is like an onion. There is so many layers to learn. Mm. You know, not every punch is a punch. Not every block is a block. You know, a block could be used as a, as a strike or, or a block could be used as a takedown or this stance could be used here. And when I started getting into that, I was like, oh, man, I love kata. So to me now, I don't explain kata as a dance using martial arts movements. Instead, it is a physical encyclopedia of martial arts techniques of self-defense techniques you know each each kata is like a volume you know of an encyclopedia it, you know and there's these different martial art techniques you can learn from it and, and i just love it because these one technique can be applied to so many different situations and i just love finding that i love learning about that i love you know we were having a class last night and, and one of the students was doing a block and i'm like whoa that could be used, you know, this way. And we practiced and it was like, it was, it was cool. All of us, all of us were like, whoa, you know, it's like those, those moments of finding out those, those little hidden gems in your kata are like, wow. Uh, it's, it's inspiring. It's just, it's so much fun. Uh, so yeah. I think that's where my passion for kata, you know, came from was one, it being personal, you know, and two, knowing that it's not just, a dance routine using karate moves, but there's so much more to it. Awesome. What was your favorite kata for competition? Uh, my favorite, I would have to say, is Goshu Shio Sho. Mm. You and favorite. many others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, if you could train with anybody that you haven't, and they can be alive, they can be dead, you know, they can be this part of the world or another, who would you want to train with? I think in my earlier days, I would have definitely said Bruce Lee. But I think nowadays, I'd actually have to change that. And I'd have to say, uh, I would love to have the opportunity to train with Tayama Khan Ken, who is the founder of Shudokan Karate. Uh, I would just love to learn directly from the one who created it. And, and one of the things that I loved about, you know, learning about this man is, you know, even back then in, in like the 40s and 50s when he was teaching, he had that mentality of this is not just this style. I, you know, he didn't even say he taught Shudokan. He said he taught karate. He didn't teach one style. He taught karate. He was very open-minded to learning the different systems of karate, learning the Nahate systems, the Shurite systems, the Tamorite systems. You know, he was very open to it. And, you know, and that early on is just, that's, that's awesome to hear about. Cause I think a lot of times we think a lot of those, you know, some masters were very much like, this is my style. And this is all I teach, you know, and, and to hear that there were masters out there that were not like that. And actually when you start researching more into these masters, you find out that m most were very open to training with other people. I, I think that's inspiring. And, and I think somehow there was a time period where people got away from that, but I like seeing that it's coming back. There's that, there's that openness again, like we were talking about earlier, you know, where people are more open to share ideas. I mean, there's camps that are based around this. There's, you know, seminars that are based around this. I think it's a, I like that. So I would have liked to have gone back to one of the earlier masters who had that mentality. Okay, great, great answer. And, and certainly similar to the answer that we hear from a lot of people the desire to go back and to kind of get in that mindset why someone put together the things that they did mm. to create their style is certainly interesting. So you've mentioned Bruce Lee. So obviously he had an influence on you. But if you had to name a favorite martial arts movie, the only martial arts movie you get to watch from now until you die, what one would you choose? It would actually be a movie called Kura Obi, uh, which is Japanese for black belt. Um, you know, I, I saw that one day. Actually, it was 
searching around YouTube and, and saw a clip of that. Like, oh. And to see them using traditional karate in an action movie and using and, and they were actually in this movie, they were using parts of kata in the fight scenes. I was like, this is cool. And so I ended up buying the movie on, you know, Amazon or something like that and, and watching it. And I was, I just fell in love with it. I was like, this is an awesome movie. You know, it really talked about the essence of what karate is. And, you know, and like I said, all the martial arts scenes in it were, were based after, you know, traditional Japanese karate. And, and that was, you know, just something I didn't really, wasn't exposed to a lot of. I was more exposed to, you know, you know, the Kung Fu like movies, Bruce Lee, you know, some, Jackie Chan, some of those, or just, you know, your typical action movies, <clears throat> you know, the Mortal Kombat that was, you know, out at that time and, and, and things. So this movie was like, wow, this is, this is cool. I really like this. I, so I just fell in love with that movie. And I think I could watch that movie over and over and over. Oh, nice. I'll have to try to find that and see if we can link to it in the show notes. And for anyone that's new to the, epi- uh, new to the show, not just the episode, hopefully this episode is new to everyone. But actually, no, I don't. I hope you're re-listening to them. Anyway, as I get off track, if you're new to the show, we put all the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And so I'll do my best to find a link to that movie if you want to check it out. And maybe even that YouTube promo that you mentioned. Now, how about martial arts actor? Yeah, so I'd have to say... Do you have a favorite there? I do. I'd have to say the actor in that movie, his name is uh, Tetsuya Naka. Um, He's got to be my my new favorite actor. Um, he's also a you know head instructor of the JKA. And so we're, you're not just seeing some actor, you know, in a movie, you're, you're seeing an actual martial artist who's got like this unbelievable background, uh, you know, of martial arts experience doing these fight scenes. And so I, I would have to say he became my favorite actor of just watching him in these in these movies um because he, he's in that movie and he's in a couple others i think it's one's called high kick girl and another one's called karate girl um you know he's mo- not the, the main character in those movies but to me he kind of is because he's just so awesome <laughs> and uh so i'd have to say he's my favorite my favorite actor from, from martial arts awesome awesome how about books are you at all a reader uh you know a little bit um you know, I'd have to say not so much of, a, you know, fictional books. I've never really been one to, to open up a fictional book. You know, I, I used to, you know, obviously in high school, you know, you're kind of forced to, you know. Um, so since then, not so much. I, I like books that teach me things, um, you know, more instructional type books. You know, so like one of my favorite books I absolutely love is uh, it's called Shotokan Secrets. Uh, I just I love that book. I love how it gets into the history of Shotokan. I love how it gets into, you know, it even goes back further than just Shotokan. Um, even though I'm not necessarily a Shotokan practitioner, I, I just I love learning about that style. I love learning about Gichin Funakoshi. I love, you know, I, I love the influence that he had in the martial arts um, community. And so I'd have to say that's my favorite book. Um, it dives into all kinds of different aspects of of karate. Um, you know, it talks about you know, some of the philosophies, it talks about, um, you know, where it got its roots, you know, it talks about, uh, you know, some of the hidden things that uh, aren't really all that well known in, in the karate mm-hmm. world, you know, so it, that was a really cool book. Um, I, I think, uh, who came up with that? I think it was the Black Belt magazine that put that out, uh, but it's a very, okay. very great book. I'll, I'll have to check that out. That's, I think that's the first time that's been mentioned on the show. I'm not familiar with it. Mm-hmm. So fantastic. I'll, I'll dig that up and probably get a copy for myself. Now you're still going, you're still teaching, you're running smart, you're you're out there, you're active. Martial arts, as we've talked about, is a massive part of who you are and what you do. But what's keeping you motivated in doing that? Do you have goals? Are there things you're working towards in the future? You know, I, I think my, my biggest goal is to, you know, one, continue to learn, you know, never to have that closed mind. Um, because, you know, one, once I stop learning, I might as well just stop, you know, so... uh you know, just continue to develop myself as both a martial artist and as a martial arts instructor. You know, so I, I think that's a big goal. Um, you know, and then I, I'd like to see, you know, the the SMART program that I, you know, I recently took over um, a couple of years ago. I'd like to just continue to develop that that circuit to be more than a circuit, but to be more of a resource for martial artists, you know, offering seminars, you know, our New England sports camp and, and 
uh, you know, offering classes that are not just for my students, but for any student that might not have an opportunity to do something. Like, you know, that's something we're doing right now. I have a Sensei Kayla Provincher uh, who comes up to our dojo and offers a weapons class. And for anyone, any dojo that might not have the opportunity to, to learn a weapon, she, she will teach anyone how to do a weapon. That way they can go to the tournaments and compete in weapons. You know, so they don't have to say, well, my, my dojo doesn't do weapons. With permission, you know, from their instructor, they can take, a, a, you know, a class and then represent their school with weapons. You know, and so we're just trying to really uh, make martial arts, you know, big, you know, hmm. and, and just make it, you know, exciting and, and just give people opportunities to, to do this and not have anything holding them back. Excellent. Excellent. So this is your commercial time. What have you got going on? I know you've got a couple tournaments going on and, and you've mentioned the camps, the summer camps and your classes. If, if people want to get a hold of you, if they're interested in being part of one of these many things you've got going on, tell us all about them. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I, ru- I run the uh, Club Naha Karate Dojo, you know, out of the Elf Anya Center in Waterville. Um, you know, so, you know, we, we always, you know, have classes going. Um, going on, we, we tend to go seven week sessions. So we actually just started our, our fall session this week. Um, you know, so we're doing that, you know, uh, I do run a tournament. It's called the Elm city karate challenge. That's coming right up in, uh, on November 12th here at the Elfon center. And, uh, we'll be there. I'll be there. All right. That's right. So <laughs> if you want to get the world's best sparring gear, it's definitely a great place to, to get access to it. Um, so, uh, you know, we got that going on. Uh, we've got the, the big state championship, which takes place uh, shortly after that. You know, so, uh, you know, the way that whole smart circuit works is we, we have seven tournaments uh, that are connected to the circuit. And, you know, people go and they compete at these different events and, you know, they're accumulating points depending on what place they uh, they get. You know, so first place would be worth 15 points, you know, and, and at the end of the year, you know, so right after the Elm City Cry Challenge, uh, all those points are, are totaled up and, and the person that has the most points in their division uh, gets what we call a divisional championship, you know, for, for placing, you know, the most points. But then what's really unique, I think, about our our, uh, our circuit is it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with just, you know, okay, you have the most points, you get an award. We then invite the top four people that had the points. So we have, the you know, the person that won the most points and the, the three after him. They're all invited to compete against one another in the state championship. And and the reason I love this is because the first place winner might have the most points because he was able to go to the most tournaments. But maybe the fourth place person is really the, you know, the one who is the strongest, you know, in kata or fighting, but they weren't able to go to as many tournaments. Well, this gives them that chance to shine. It gives that person a chance to get in that ring and, and kind of prove themselves to kind of, you know, have that opportunity to, to get in there and, and, and show what they can do. So I, I really just love that. It's not just, all right, you went to the most tournaments, you, you know, here you go, here's, here's your points. It gives the underdog a chance to get in there and, and show their stuff. Mm. Um, so that's coming up. Yeah. And, you know, we're, you know, now taking the, you know, registrations are ready for the, the New England sport camp, which, uh, will be in, you know, late August, uh, you know, of 2017. So we're kind of gearing up for, for that. And I, if I remember correctly, you're going to be a guest instructor at that. Is that correct? I, I am. I mean, you, you asked me, I think I was home for three days from teaching this year and you asked me to come back, which means that the kids must have had a good time. I know I had a great time. So oh, it, it, it. it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And, and I, I have to confess that the entire time I was there, I was jealous that something like that didn't exist when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, it, it is a lot of fun. It's, it's definitely one of those, yeah. those events that I, you know, I already can't wait for it. You know, it's it's a year out and I'm already like, I can't wait. You know, I've been kind of getting fired up, getting, you know, different guest instructors uh, on board. Um, you know, it's looking like, you know, at currently it looks like we're going to have, uh, you know, she and Andy Campbell um, from Dragon Fire Martial Arts coming out. Looks like we're going to also have uh, Sensei, I'm uh, not Sensei, I'm sorry, uh, Renchi Lisa Magira from uh, the Bushido Karate Dojo from, uh, I think that's the Casco area area coming mm-hmm. out to teach and then yep. um we have uh since a caleb preventure 
uh, coming out, and, and we have uh, something Jonathan Lexus coming back out again to do the Ninja Warrior obstacle course. Um, yeah, he was he was on Ninja Warrior, right? He was, he, and I guess yeah, currently yeah. his son is still still quite involved, and, and just recently was on TV making it to the next level. Um, oh, so cool! He, he's yeah, his son is is doing a a really good job with with that, and uh, I believe they're they're going to just continue doing that, and they're going to uh, you know bring it back to the to the sport karate camp and give kids an opportunity to to kind of taste that. And I think that was a big nice. highlight of this previous year was, uh, was kids getting able to do, uh, do the obstacle course. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a lot of, saw a lot of great pictures. And of course there's websites to go with all these that we'll link over at the show notes. Uh, but for people that, that aren't going to make it there, uh, new England sports camps.org, right? Yeah. Uh, smart tournaments.com. Right. And club Naha, N-A-H-A karate do.com. Right. Right. Okay. Great. Oh, and I don't want to leave anybody out on that on that guest list of of the sport cry game. So we also have Kyoshi Brent Krishi, who's uh, who, who's definitely um, a fan favorite. Um, yeah. You know. <laughs> He's a riot. Yeah. Right. So he he's coming back out to to camp as well. I just didn't want to leave anybody out. Awesome. No, no, yeah. it's certainly not a, not a worry. Um, and those are those are great people. I mean, it was it was an honor to be included with that group, and you know, and I, I certainly had a lot of fun. And and got to know a lot of the the kids better that I only get, you know, short bits of time with at events, so that was fun. And I think what's rewarding now, too is you'll see that they are using what they've learned. You know, I remember uh, after you left, that we we did some sparring the next day, and they were implementing what you were teaching, and they were using it in their sparring. And I was like, "Hey, you must have learned that from Sensei Jeremy. That's awesome." You know, so <laughs> cool. that that was really cool to kind of see them using what they learned. Well, that, that's the dream as an instructor, right? That, that's that, that they actually implement what you teach them. So, exactly. Oh uh, yeah. Good. Now we always go out on on a high note if we can, and you've shared so many amazing things with us today. I have no doubt that this will also be amazing. Any parting advice for the people listening? Um, you know, I think I have more advice maybe for the younger people that might be listening today, you know, um, for, for them, I I would say to those younger, you know, black belts, maybe the ones that are not teaching karate, but they're, they're active in their school. Just remember one black belt is not the end. I think there's so many younger black belts that get to that black belt stage. And unfortunately think of that as their ultimate goal and we, you know, we've seen in the past where they kind of fade away. Stay involved. Stay with it. You know, I would say that from the white belt to the black belt is all you know, about oneself. It's about what, what can I get from the martial arts. From the black belt on is all about what can I give to others now. Through what I've learned, what can I do to help others in the martial arts? You know, so it, before it's all about, you know, like I would say, like, it's all about me. It's all about me. Now it's not. Now it's about what can I do to inspire others to be great martial artists. And hopefully I'll inspire those great martial artists to inspire other people to be great martial artists. Um, so just get out there and inspire people. And it doesn't mean that you have to be the greatest martial arts instructor in the world. It just means getting in the dojo and being a mentor to some younger student and being there for them giving them good advice, just helping them out. And that's going to go a long way. Like I said, that was a very candid, open conversation. If you have the opportunity to meet Renchi Sargent, make sure you say hello. And thank you, Renchi, for your time. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find photos and links to everything we talked about, including some great photos and links to all of his websites. You can see his signature graphics work on each of those. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our sort of not quite secret Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. It's not linked anywhere, so you'll have to do a search for it. We're always open to new guests for the show. So if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or perhaps your instructor or someone else that you know, head on over to the website, WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, and fill out the form there. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it, and you can do that on the website as well. 
If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing so you never miss out on a new episode. Remember, twice a week. You know, we're always asking for reviews too because they help us spread the word of the show and push us up in the rankings, which helps new people find us and that whole cycle continues and it allows us to get bigger and better guests. If you like what we're doing, this is the best way to help. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our colorful pro hoodie. If you're a school owner or a team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. And that's all for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.